Blue Origin launched its first crewed mission on its new Shepard rocket on July 20 to fly its billionaire founder Jeff Bezos and three other passengers to suborbital space and back. The autonomous new Shepard which consists of a rocket topped by a capsule lifted off from Blue Origin's launch site 1 in West Texas on Tuesday. The capsule carried Jeff Bezos, his brother Mark Bezos, Mercury 13 and aviation pioneer Wally Funk, and a Dutch physics student Oliver Damon. Two minutes and 35 seconds after liftoff, the crew capsule called RSS first step, separated from its booster. The craft's momentum carried it upward in an unpowered flight, culminating at an altitude of about 107 kilometers. The crew members experienced three to four minutes of microgravity during the flight. As they were performing somersaults in microgravity, Earth was visible in the background through the huge windows of the spacecraft. The capsule then came down under a set of parachutes and fired its thrusters briefly to cushion its touchdown for the four passengers inside. The rocket also returned safely, making a powered vertical touchdown at its designated landing zone. All of this action, from liftoff to landings, took just over 10 minutes. The four crew members emerged from the capsule a few minutes after landing, and Blue Origin's recovery team joined the crew to celebrate their return from space. The launch set a record for both the oldest and youngest person to fly. At 82, Wally Funk became the oldest person to fly to space, and at 18, Oliver Damon became the youngest. Damon who joined the crew on July 15 took the place of the winner of a June 12 auction, who bid $28 million for the seat, but later had scheduling conflicts that kept that person from flying. The flight was the first time that New Shepard, which started its test flight program in 2015, carried people. The vehicle is designed to fly autonomously, and all previous flights carried only experiments or other cargo. Blue Origin plans to conduct two more crewed New Shepard flights this year, with the first in late September or early October. NASA selected SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket to launch Earth's first mission to perform a detailed investigation of Jupiter's moon Europa. The Europa Clipper mission which got the green light from NASA in 2015 is destined to fly by the moon 44 times, providing researchers with a tantalizing look at the icy world. Europa Clipper will conduct a detailed survey of Europa and use a sophisticated suite of science instruments to investigate whether the icy moon has conditions suitable for life. Key mission objectives are to produce high-resolution images of Europa's surface, determine its composition, look for signs of geological activities, measure the thickness of the moon's icy shell, search for subsurface lakes, and determine the depth and salinity of Europa's ocean. For years, the mission was legally obligated to launch on NASA's long-delayed space launch system. But with the SLS perpetually delayed and over budget, NASA has urged Congress to consider allowing the Europa Clipper to fly commercial. According to NASA, switching to a commercial launch vehicle could save up to $700 million in the budget. NASA announced that the mission will launch on a Falcon Heavy rocket in October 2024 from Kennedy Space Center, and the total contract amount for launch services is approximately $178 million. According to the agency, SLS would have sent Clipper on a direct-to-Jupiter trajectory, arriving at the giant planet less than three years after liftoff. But the use of a commercial rocket will require Clipper to perform speed-boosting flybys of Mars and Earth before reaching the destination in April 2030. A federal appeals court denied a motion from satellite operator Viasat to stop SpaceX from enlarging its Starlink mega-constellation. Viasat, an American communications company based in California, sued the Federal Communications Commission in May, asking to stop or at least slow Starlink's expansion, as FCC is legally obligated to assess the megaconstellation's environmental impact. Moreover, Viasat stated that it will suffer competitive injury if Starlink is allowed to compete directly with Viasat in the market for satellite broadband services. The FCC order that Viasat challenged was another license modification granted in April 2021 that lowered the altitude of the 2,824 Starlink satellites to 550 kilometers. Last month, on June 14, the FCC and SpaceX filed briefs opposing Viasat's motion for a stay. The FCC told judges that it closely examined and reasonably rejected Viasat's claims. The commission considered the alleged effect in detail and found insufficient evidence that SpaceX's license modification requires further review. The FCC said in its court brief that the license change fell into a category of actions that normally do not have a significant effect on the human environment. After hearing the plea from Viasat and analyzing the briefs from FCC, a three-judge panel at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit ruled on July 20 that Viasat has not satisfied the stringent requirements for a stay pending court review. The court also granted a motion to expedite the appeal, setting dates that end with an October 26 deadline for final briefs to clear the way for oral arguments. 
In response to the court order, a Viasat spokesperson told Space News that the company remains optimistic the court will conclude that the FCC violated federal law by failing to analyze the environmental impacts of the deployment of satellites into already crowded portions of space. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope returned to science operations after a pause of more than a month as controllers successfully switched the orbiting observatory to a backup payload computer. According to NASA, Hubble's payload computer, which controls and coordinates the observatory's onboard science instruments halted suddenly on June 13, and it automatically placed Hubble's science instruments into safe mode. The Hubble team moved quickly to investigate what ailed the observatory and figured out the cause of the problem. Hubble alumni returned to support the current team in the recovery effort, lending decades of mission expertise. After weeks of investigation, engineers concluded that the most likely cause of the payload computer problem was a malfunction of a power control unit, which supplies voltage to the hardware in the computer. With no ability to reset the power control unit from the ground, engineers decided to switch to backup hardware, which has its own power control unit. By July 16, NASA reported success in turning on the backup computer system, and by July 17, controllers had restored the science instruments from the safe modes, and Hubble restarted science observations. The telescope then snapped its first images since the whole catastrophe started. The telescope focused its lens on a set of unusual galaxies. One of its new images shows a pair of galaxies slowly colliding, the other image shows a spiral galaxy with long extended arms. Despite the recent problems, astronomers remain optimistic that Hubble will continue to operate well into the decade. Russia launched a long-delayed module for its segment of the International Space Station on a mission to expand the orbiting station. A Proton-M rocket lifted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome carrying the multipurpose laboratory module, Ernaka, on July 21. The module successfully separated from the upper stage of the rocket 9 minutes and 40 seconds after liftoff. Three minutes later, Roscosmos confirmed that the module successfully deployed its solar panels and antennas, beginning its eight-day autonomous flight to the ISS. The spacecraft initially failed to complete its first orbit-raising burn, leading to concerns that it might not complete the trip. Thankfully, the NACA team on Earth was able to perform a course correction burn on July 23, and the module is now in the proper orbit to continue its journey. NACA, which is expected to dock at the orbital outpost on July 29, will become the largest Russian component of the station. Roscosmos originally proposed launching the module in 2007, but extensive technical issues pushed back the launch repeatedly. Over 13 meters long, and with a maximum diameter of 4.3 meters, the 23,000 kg module will house research facilities, provide a spare bed for a cosmonaut, as well as a toilet, oxygen regeneration system, and gear for recycling water from urine. NACA also features an active docking port and an airlock, which will be serviced by the 11 meters long European robotic arm, traveling folded and attached to the module. The European robotic arm is the first robot capable of walking around the Russian parts of the orbital complex. It can handle components up to 8,000 kg with 5 mm precision, and will transport astronauts from one working site to another. ESA astronaut Thomas Peskett will welcome the robotic arm and assist in setting it up. Five spacewalks are planned to get the arm ready and perform its first space operations. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX's Super Heavy Booster, which is undergoing development to propel the Starship spacecraft to orbit, had completed a major milestone last week. The prototype booster, designated Booster 3, fired up its three sea-level Raptor engines for the first time on July 19. The brief ignition happened during a static fire test, in which the stainless steel vehicle was filled with liquid methane and oxygen propellants to assess engine performance. The 70 meters tall booster remained grounded to a test stand as engineers ignited the Raptor engines for a few seconds. As usual, LabPadre Live streamed the static fire test in high definition from multiple angles. In the history of Starship testing, this is the first time that initial prototypes have smoothly sailed through cryogenic proof test and static fire test on the first attempt. In short, Super Heavy's smooth testing makes it abundantly clear that SpaceX's Starship launch vehicle design, production, and operations are rapidly maturing as the company speeds towards its first orbital launch attempt. After that brief ignition on Monday, SpaceX confirmed it was a successful static fire test by sharing an incredible photograph of Booster 3 via Twitter. Even though only three engines were installed for the static fire test, the final version of Starship will have incredible power with a total of 33 Raptor engines. SpaceX founder Elon Musk shared on Twitter after Booster 3's debut ignition that, depending on progress with Booster 4, SpaceX might try a nine-engine static fire test on Booster 3.
Those nine engines will be the inner engines of the booster, which are capable of providing gimbal thrust to the launch vehicle. In a gimbal thrust system, the engine will be swiveled on two axes from side to side, changing the direction of the thrust relative to the center of gravity of the rocket. The thrust puck of Booster 3 already has mounting points for the nine Raptor engines. With nine Raptors installed, Booster 3 could produce up to 2,000 kN of thrust during a brief static fire, showcasing the power of the launch system. Three days after the static fire test, SpaceX crews removed all three engines from the booster and returned them one by one to the Starship build site. These engines will go through a series of checks and inspections to investigate the engine condition. Therefore, to conduct a nine-engine test, SpaceX needs to install a fresh set of engines into the booster in the upcoming weeks. In addition to rocket ground tests, SpaceX is simultaneously building a launch tower at their Texas Starship launch site to support orbital flight tests. After installing the eighth prefabricated section of the launch tower on July 18, workers shifted their focus to building the ninth and the final segment of the tower. Unlike the previous seven sections which were assembled at the build site before being transported to the launch site, SpaceX is preparing to assemble the ninth section right at the launch site. The parts of the ninth section arrived at the launch site on July 20. These ninth section columns are comparatively shorter than that of the previous sections and are currently being joined together at the launch site. In a recent aerial flyover, RGV aerial photography spotted certain parts at the build site that could be the pieces of the launch tower carriage system. And recently, OceanCam captured some black cylindrical parts being delivered to the build site on a truck. These parts are assumed to be the segments of the booster catching arm. Once functional, the arm will catch the super heavy booster in mid-air, and the carriage attached to a rail will lower the booster to the ground. As soon as the Starship launch system, launch tower, and ground support facilities are ready for operation, the first orbital flight test of the Starship will lift off from Starbase into the skies. To keep up with the increasing launch pace of both SpaceX and other commercial space agencies, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration opened a new space safety office in Texas. The office will oversee space operations that take place in Texas and New Mexico, including Starship operations. From this location, FAA inspectors will be able to more effectively and efficiently monitor the ongoing testing programs and commercial space tourism operations of SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Virgin Galactic. The administration said that it streamlined and modernized its commercial space launch and reentry licensing regulations to allow the agency to spend more time on safety oversight and less on paperwork. In March, an FAA inspector who was tasked with overseeing SpaceX's Starship flight test did not arrive on time because they had to travel to Texas from FAA headquarters, causing SpaceX to delay the flight test of Starship serial number 11. The new FAA office could enable inspectors to arrive on time to oversee testing operations without delaying SpaceX's ambitious Starship development program. Moving on to other Starship updates, the width of the recently spotted aft flap of Starship serial number 20 appears to be 30% smaller than previous flaps. During the early design evolution of the flaps, SpaceX increased the total area of the aft flaps by 10% and forward flaps by 20%. The aft flaps of serial number 8 and subsequent prototypes had an approximate maximum width of 4.4 meters. Now, according to Elon Musk, flight tests showed that SpaceX could make body flaps of Starships narrower and lighter, without compromising performance. In short, real-world tests of Starships are bringing major design upgrades to the ship, and these early lessons are much valuable for the future of the Starship development program. Recently a Pathfinder nose cone was spotted at the build site with thermal protection tile on one side and a cargo bay door cut out on the other side. The cargo version of the Starship can be used to deliver satellites and payloads to orbits. Starship, being the world's most powerful launch vehicle ever developed, is capable of carrying approximately 100 metric tons to Earth's orbit. The cargo variant of the Starship can also handle the in-space recovery of spacecraft and space debris for return to Earth or movement to another orbit. The large cargo bay door of the Starship can open in space to facilitate delivery and pickup of cargo. The initial operational flights of the Starship will be cargo missions carrying Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. SpaceX President Gwynne Shotwell had previously mentioned that Starship could hold 400 satellites per launch. According to Elon Musk, actual payload bay door dimensions are still under debate, and Starship has a payload volume of approximately 1,000 cubic meters. He added that Starship could capture and return the Hubble Space Telescope to Earth once that iconic spacecraft retires from its service. The Pathfinder nose cone was cut into pieces and sent to the scrapyard on July 23. The booster hold-down structure received hydraulic cylinders last week. 
it is assumed that this massive structure will be used as a working platform to hold the Super Heavy Booster for pre-launch preparations. SpaceX has begun the production of Super Heavy Booster 5. The aft dome of Booster 5 was spotted at the build site last week. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.